We have Alex Bokoff and Dan Connolly. They'll be talking about medical informatics and uh, how to scrape up all of our medical data and make some use of it. So let's welcome them. Let's welcome them. All right. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So hi, I'm Dan Connolly. And I'm Alex Bokoff. And we're gonna, today we're going to talk about using uh, Python and Paver to control a large medical informatics ETL process. Um, so uh, I'm from the University of Kansas Medical Center, mostly writing software to support research, all kinds of logos about my past history. Um, the one that's most relevant is that I'm software development lead for this uh, Greater Plains Collaborative, which you'll hear more about. And me, when I was 14 years old, I decided that I wanted to cure death, because, you know, why not? Um, and, uh, you know, so I went, to, I went to school for a bunch of time, um, you know, got a PhD in physiology, and then it turned out that the real, I realized that the real limiting factor is not collecting more data, but making sense of the data that's being collected. Apparently, there's fewer people willing to grind up data than to grind up mice. So, um, uh, you know, back to the drawing board, I, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm okay with computers. I, I uh, you know, uh, took, uh, took some more coursework in applied statistics, and now I am working uh, at the UT Health Science Center, uh, Department of Epidemiology and Biostatistics, uh, um, attacking that same problem from a, from a bioinformatics uh, point of view. Of course, um, grant review committees don't like it when you sound crazy, so instead of saying, I'm here to cure death, I, we, we, we call it uh, the fight against cancer, heart disease, neurodegeneration, um, 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 diabetes, uh, um, um, morbidity, frailty, but in the end, it's, it's all one problem. We, um, so this, uh, the Greater Plains Collaborative is a, is a group of 10 um, um, academic uh, hospitals and clinics scattered sort of like down the middle of the United States. Um, and we, well, Dan and I are kind of a cross-section of the GPC. Dan comes from the, uh, Dan comes from the middle of it, from, from Kansas City, where GPC was founded. Uh, and I come from the very edge, from, one of, from the newest uh, GPC member site. And uh, Dan knows a ton about um, software engineering, and I mostly try to keep up with him. So why mine medical data? You, um, the, the most obvious answer is uh, why mine any data? There are, some, there are hidden correlations, there are risk factors waiting to be discovered simply because nobody has been able to look there before. And I'll get uh, to in a minute why um, it, uh, nobody's looked in medical records before at this scale. Um, secondly, feasibility studies. Are there enough patients um, fitting a particular criterion for you to be able to do a clinical study on them? Um, and if your study is feasible, and let's say it gets approved, um, this same tool can be used for a physician to reach out to patients um, who have a particular disease and ask them if they're interested in volunteering um, for a clinical trial. And finally, um, kind of uh, sort of a recurring theme probably throughout this meeting is visualizing the data, forming new hypotheses, sort of playing with the data. Um, and, um, okay. But there are hurdles um, to be overcome. First of all, um, we have to have, our queries have to run uh, at an acceptable speed to the users despite the size of the data. Um, uh, our um, queries have to yield repeatable results um, despite the ever increasing complexity of the data with each, um, with each additional load. Um, and finally, we need to give our scientists flexibility and independence um, in, in pursuing their research without compromising on patient privacy. We can't just have them tell us what they want done and have us be their intermediaries. To the greatest extent we can, we'd like for them for it to be a self-service kind of operation. Um, so when I'm talking about size, um, we have a KUMC has 1.3 billion observations on 2 million patients. And this has to the, the, um, um, the, they have to query over this, you know, within minutes of, for, 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 for some of the queries. Um, when we're talking about complexity, we're pulling data from a very diverse range of sources, many of them never intended to be um, a data source for research. 
um, you're going to be hearing a lot about this top left one. This is, um, uh, this is a database known as Clarity, um, made by a company called Epic. Um, and it is uh, widely used um, in hospitals for um, patient billing and patient records. Um, there's a number of other data sources. Uh, Social Security Death Master File, for example, um, can, can reveal um, the, the ages of at death for patients. Um, the, um, we have biospecimen repositories. We have tumor registries um, and, and in a, in a constantly growing list of data sources, all of them in different formats, and they have to be unified into a single repository that can be queried from a single point. Um, and when we're talking about patient privacy, so we are um, paranoid privacy geeks to begin with, and the um, industry we work in kind of almost legally mandates that we be that way uh, be, uh, through, uh, through a number of regulations, including HIPAA, the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act. Um, in plain English, it means the data has to be securely, uh, has to be maintained securely. Um, uh, use of this data for any purpose other than you know, the, 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 um, um, its original intended one is subject to IRB approval. But if we can scrub the data of identifying information, particularly patient IDs and dates, um, this data is no longer human subject data, and we can make the researchers' lives easier because we apply for IRB approval and then pass the data on to them so they don't have to, and so they could concentrate on science and not um, on bureaucracy. Um, so at the front end, um, this, is the, this is the system um, that we use to overcome these hurdles, and the user interface to the system um, is something called I2B2. It's an open source tool developed at Harvard for, um, uh, for, 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 uh, for use as a uh, medical uh, data repository. And when a researcher logs in to the I2B2 website, this is what they see. In the top left panel, um, there are various, um, uh, there are various um, terms. Now, what I mean by terms is really very general. It's almost anything you can observe about a patient during a visit. It could be something like body weight, so like a numeric variable. It could, be, it could be a categorical variable, such as ethnicity. It could be a, it could be a binary flag, like are they, do they have a particular diagnosis or not? Um, and there is a large number of different categorization schemes that can be applied to the same data, and all of them are accessible through here. So let's say you want to select a group of patients that have a set of characteristics. Um, you find your terms in this hierarchical list, you drag them to the query interface, you run the query, and you get, um, an, uh, and you get a result set. So here, each of these sections is an individual patient, um, and within each section, these horizontal lines represent the different variables that you are um, that you're that you've that you've chosen. Um, these tick um, and the horizontal axis is time. So you, here you're following a patient, and observations are being made at various times. Um, so for example, this top variable is uh, BMI, body mass index. Um, this bottom variable uh, is, is, uh, are, is, is a hemoglobin assay. Now, you, you can't see the actual values that were obtained at these points, but you know that data was collected at those points for those patients. So, um, and at the back end, this data is stored in a star schema, which is common idiom in data warehouses. Um, this, this, uh, in the middle, uh, you see an, a, a fact table each entry in this table represents a particular observation made about a particular patient um, during a particular visit to a particular healthcare provider. And the remaining table um, maps concept codes to query terms that the user can interact with. Okay, so, so that's what um, pretty much comes out of the box with, with I2B2. What doesn't come out of the box is software to load the data into that star schema from the various systems that we get it out of, the hospital record system, et cetera. So the way that we do that is we get the data from, on the, on the left there, the left there, the particip participating uh, clinical systems, the hospital mainly. Uh, we get sort of an oracle data dump of their stuff. We load it into, uh, on our side, then we transform it into the shape that I2B2 wants to see um, and load it. 
And then we run that, like, like you said, scrubbing stuff to get the, the identifiers and the dates fuzzed. And we copy it to a whole other separate machine. And that's the database that's, that's used at runtime uh, for researchers by the, to run their queries. And one of the techniques we use to make this whole thing work um, is that while the scientists are using uh, database A in production, we've got a whole copy of that whole system there um, that's connected to the ITV2 software in production. And then while that's running, um, the developers and stuff in the, are in the back of the closet uh, filling up the B database from, from this month's uh, ETL. Then uh, when um, this month's stuff is all ready, we flip and flop and we connect uh, the ITB2 software to the new data and then the developers uh, start running the ETL for the next month. So there's some trade-offs to this. The reason we do it is that we get a short downtime on the order of an hour to switch over uh, instead of on the order of 50 hours, which is how long the ETL job takes to run. Uh, and that's if it works well. Uh, so if it didn't work well, then we would have to continue to debug and all that kind of stuff, and the whole system would be offline. Uh, so we go ahead and we bite the bullet, and uh, we take the st 2x storage hit, um, which uh, is, is cheaper than the, the customer and developer time, uh, even though we're using Fusion IO solid state storage and stuff. So uh, big ATL jobs like this, there are some tools out there in the market. We took a look at Talon and Pentaho. Um, we found some kind of performance scalability issues in them. They didn't seem to be quite a good match. Um, Microsoft has this SSIS tool, doesn't really match very well uh, when most of our data comes from Oracle. Um, there's Oracle PL SQL, which is a language I guess a lot of people use for this. I didn't take a close look at that. Um, so we didn't use any of those. We ended up developing our own. But we did run down to some of the same features that they provide. We ended up needing a powerful job control user interface. Some kind of logging, monitoring, and testing. It's a big job, runs lights out. You want to know what's going on. Uh, and it turns out to get kind of complex. And so you do want the visualization uh, that, that uh, a lot of those tools uh, uh, give you. And a major concern was the ability to bring on new developers and system administrators uh, quickly. So we started with some SQL code we got from peers in the IT develop, ITB2 developer community that loads some of the data from, from Epic, the Clarity database. And we just used Oracle's SQL developer tool and stepped through the code manually, line by line. Uh, and then when I thought about running this stuff lights out, for me, I'm a SQL, I mean, I'm a Python developer. SQL is the stuff that goes between the quote marks, right? Uh, <laughs> So I was putting it in there, and then, well, so the guy, the SQL developer on the team, you know, he's not going to go into the Python code and edit the stuff between the quote marks. That's a pain. So we put the SQL in the SQL files, and, the, and then the Python reads the, the SQL uh, scripts and runs it. And, and the SQL really dominates here. We've got 20,000 lines of SQL code and just about five, line, five kilobytes, 5,000 lines of uh, Python. So there's a little function in the middle of the thing that uh, splits SQL scripts into SQL statements. It mostly just looks for semicolons, but you got to be careful if the semicolon occurs in a, in a comment or, a, or a, str a string constant, something like that. OK, so then you, you get this great big SQL script that, driven by Python, and it runs and takes a long time. Uh, and maybe it runs all the way to the end, or maybe it doesn't. You've got to debug part of it. Or maybe it's all working great, and you want to add something to it. Well, so it turns out you want to kind of break this thing into chunks. And so what are we going to use as a job control user interface? Well, uh, I'm a kind of a long-time Unix guy. The command line's good enough for me. Um, but how, do we gonna, are we gonna, how are we going to arrange the thing in parts? Well, the job sort of looked like make to me. You have different make targets, and the one target depends on another. Um, and I found a Python package called Paver, uh, where it has these task things. And they look a little bit like make file targets to me. So you can say Paver heron load, and it'll go find the heron load in your uh, function in your code. And you can give it configuration uh, parameters and stuff like that, a lot like make. Uh, and uh, you can uh, have dependencies between one task and another. You, tell, you ask it to, we've got this um, load Epic Labs task we've developed. And if you, if you ask it to run that one, um, it knows to run the make Epic Labs of use task first. 
And you tell it the relationship between uh, the tasks by, by when you define the load Epic Labs thing, you tell it that it needs the make Epic Labs views task. That's kind of what the syntax looks like. Um, so uh, then this is what, the, the, what the, you want to visualize the results. You gotta, we end up with a lot of these tasks. So here's a few of them connected. There's a few of them, more of them connected. And that's actually the whole thing. There's 110 of these things, um, and, and we had to debug some actual some cycles in there. That's a really bad thing. Um, and when we, when we were able to look at the whole thing like this, we noticed that some snarls in the code, and we were able to reorganize it. It really helped. Uh, so how do we get this picture? It's kind of one of the interesting tricks. Um, parsing Python and getting all the, the data dependencies, you know, getting the toothpaste back in the tube might look really difficult, but it turns out that the Python standard library has this abstract syntax tree AST module, and you just use that API and it'll call you back every time there's a function def definition. So, and all I do is for every function definition, I figure out where are the needs doodads on there, and it's another 15 or 20 lines to figure out the dependencies between the tasks, and uh, it writes it out in a comma-separated values uh, file and convert that to the graph is format, and, and then it builds these great big diagrams. So we get it all working, and then uh, uh, the boss comes in and says, we need allergies. We didn't have allergies next month. We're going to have allergies next month. Um, so this is our development process. Uh, so the first thing we do is, is we try to say, well, OK, well, what do you mean we want to use allergies? And, and, and he says, well, we've got to research it. He wants to know, for example, how many patients get hives from penicillin. All right, so that's a, that's a use case I can sink my teeth into. And so now I go looking through the 6,000 tables in Clarity, and I go try and look through their documentation, um, their data dictionary, et cetera, and I find the allergy data, and I write some SQL queries, and I eventually find out, uh, and I figure out where the data is to answer this question about how many patients get hives from penicillin, and all the other re allergic reactions, and all the other allergens, et cetera. So then we write a little bit more code to transform this into the shape that I2B2 expects, and the terms stuff. And then, uh, so now you're sort of running the stuff interactively, then you gotta do a little bit more software engineering to get it to run lights out with automated testing and such. Uh, so one of the forms of testing we do, um, you might find a constraint that looks like it's there in the data that's really not in the SQL schema. And so what we do is we go, okay, well, it's, there's none of these patients over 90 today, but I wanna make sure there's no patients over 90 when it's running lights out when I'm not around. So we write this SQL statement where if there are any patients over 90 years old, which is against the rules for de-identification, it'll divide by zero, and, and it's kind of like an assertion test. Okay, so for example, uh, suppose we're rolling back in time and we're just gonna do labs. What we wanna do is get the data out of, the Clarity stuff is on the left, that's the hospital database, then we're gonna transform it and put it into the identified star schema, and then we're gonna de-identify it and put it into the the de-identified stuff on the right. And the first half of that, going from clarity to the I2B2 shape, so here's the reminder of the I2B2 schema. We're trying to get it into something that looks like that, especially that middle table. So we select from the relevant clarity tables. Here's the social, so this is a, not labs, this is social history. So we've got the smoking tobacco use table and such like that. And so we go find the relevant tables, and the relevant, the relevant part of clarity that's analogous to the encounter number in I2B2, likewise for patient number. Um, concept code is a particularly interesting one for this one. This is the actual tobacco status, uh, et cetera. There's a few others that are straightforward. Start date, et cetera. Okay, and then we have the gray box, uh, observation fact lab or the, anal the analogous for uh, social history. Um, so that gives us into the shape that I2B2 is interested in. And then we uh, load it into uh, the database correlating patients with, uh, correlating the data on pa by patient with data from other sources. There's essentially a fact table. Start, we start out with a fact table for each um, data source, sometimes several fact tables for each data source, and we glob them all together by patient into a unified fact table that then becomes that one that uh, Dan just showed. Right. So that goes into the identified stuff, and then we run a big pile of SQL, well, not a great big pile of SQL, 100 lines of SQL or whatever, to uh, shift the dates and such. Okay, that, so that second part, 
Uh, it, the first part, sorry. The first part, we gotta write special code like this for social, social history, another one for labs, another one for meds, like that. The second half, sorry. The second half um, of getting the, loading the data in and, and correlating the patients, we just have one hunk of SQL and we just substitute in the, the name right there at Epic Fact View. That's one of these uh, sort of a macro that we've adopted from Oracle SQL Plus. Uh, but we use mostly the same hunk of SQL and we just replace this, this one little variable in there and run it over and over. Um, so that's the, one of the kind of features that I couldn't find in those ETL tools. Okay, so after you pull your hair out and do whatever, uh, you finally get the thing to work and the query works and you've got your no number of patients and uh, this previous queries thing, I2B2 actually for, um, for just reuse and for auditing purposes, it saves an XML representation in your query and it saves the generated SQL that it actually used to run the query. So we've got a little capture query utility that goes and grabs that out of the audit tables and saves it in our test data set. And then we've got another test hair and query thing that, that at release time we go rerun all these queries and make sure they still work. Okay, so then you've done all that development, then you check with one of your peers on the team and you uh, see, you know, is this code that they would be willing to maintain? There's a few other things on our checklist about, you know, uh, is the code dry and such like this. And uh, if, if everybody's happy, then you check it into the production and on we go, month to month to month to month. And as of uh, January, we were up to 35 consecutive uh, monthly updates to the whole system with uh, new data every month and usually some, a few ne new features every month. So the whole thing is, is going along reasonably well. Uh, along the way, pretty recently, uh, we've introduced uh, continuous integrations using Jenkins. I'm not a big um, uh, Java guy, but this thing you can install almost by mistake when you weren't looking, it's really easy. <laughs> uh, so every time there's a commit and push, we run all the unit tests. Um, hourly, there's a monitoring query that makes sure that, well, that tries to make sure that we find out before the customers do if the whole thing falls over. Um, daily, we run an integration test build with a small set of a few hundred patients, test data, test patients. Um, daily, we run, we take our performance suite and we don't actually run the whole performance suite, but we check that the, um, we do an explain plan on, make sure the plans, execution plans have not changed. Then weekly, we run, um, uh, sort of a 1% or maybe half percent sample of the whole production data and we run the whole performance suite and actually measure, measure the time. All right, so logging I mentioned is kind of important with lights out. You want to find out what was going on there and uh, Paver has some logging support that's sort of glorified print statements and, and this worked okay but I got tired of grepping the log files and stuff like that. And I explored some alternatives the Python uh, configurable logging API gets you a certain um, distance. I tried maybe the Jenkins X unit um, test user interface. Um, and I ended up writing some code, uh, this nested event stuff that relates, you've got one statement in a SQL script that's part of the, the script of, as a whole. And so I want to be able to see the relationship between those things in the logs. So that was this nested events thing. And I ended up spitting out the logs um, with just a little bit of uh, formatting to make them comma separated values. So you double the quote marks and put some commas in there. And uh, what you get is something you can load into Excel and filter just for the database connections or just for the errors or just for the th things of this sort. You can even do R plots or Python or whatever. Um, there's very, you know, little Python scripts that filter the thing. Um, I've got a log outline I can show if somebody wants to ask a question about it. Uh, this is a plot that we use to, you know, which things take a long time out of this 40 or 50 hours so we can uh, figure out whether we should optimize that or if, if it's just a lot of data. Um, okay, so earlier we visualized the task dependencies, but that actually doesn't show you the data dependencies completely. Um, so how did we get the data dependencies? Um, this was kind of a fun exercise. Turned out there's a SQL parser that's one of the examples in the pi parsing package by Paul McGuire. McGuire. Uh, it only did select and it was only for SQLite. So I did insert and update and the rest of those things and expanded it for crazy Oracle things like connect by. Um, and out comes the CSV version of the data dependencies. Where was the dependency and, and what was the source and the, data, the destination of it and out comes those, uh, then we run it through graph is and out comes these diagrams, which is pretty cool. So that's pretty much the ETL approach. Uh, it's, it's a little non-traditional in some places, but we find it's workable. 
Uh, some of the tools try to uh, shield you from, from SQL. We embrace it. Uh, at the end of the day, you're going to have it at least in the, co in the corners using those tools, and we just figure what the heck. Uh, and we exploit general purpose programming language, Python. Um, that way we can use all the good traditional tools, version control, unit testing. Uh, we don't have a user interface that's a diagram for building the, the, the job, but we do get the visualizations. They are available as a byproduct. Um, the training and team scaling experience has been largely positive. We started out with myself and one other guy on the team, and now we're up to on the order of five developers at KU Mid Center. And uh, you know, th th three additional sites joining, including mine. And now, uh, n n now this uh, um, ETL process is being developed at multiple sites. Um, and um, we're moving toward a, a robust, uh, well, they have, and we're moving toward a robust, uh, a secure um, uh, uh, um, clinical data warehouse. All right, so we're getting our patients, and our researchers are, are getting some fun stuff, and our uh, patients are still reasonably secure, we think. And so here, um, you know, um, um, one future direction is um, exporting data into R for, for, for more uh, sort of granular analytics. Although, of course, this can be done in, in NumPy, and, uh, and, and you know, that, that's, uh, that's also kind of uh, uh, on, on the agenda. Um, here you see um, some sort of toy survival curves uh, plotted within R and, and then uh, um, rendered back on the I2B2 uh, uh, screen. So, and, uh, yeah. Yeah, so while I was developing that, among some of the other pieces of code, as the, as the Python code starts to get larger, um, so Python's great for little things and stuff like that, but as it starts to get larger, I start to wonder, and my teammates start to gripe a little bit about the ability to read the code with all the types left implicit. Um, and when I want to re refactor the code, I know I got to go through and find all the occurrences of something and replace it. Uh, do I have enough tests to make sure I've got them all? Um, and it turns out I had a kind of a hobby project where I was converting something from Python to Scala, uh, and it ended up de defining this kind of, as a byproduct, this, this well-typed dialog of, uh, dialect of Python, where if you kind of avoid a few uh, Python dynamic idioms like keyword arguments, you, what you end up with is completely reliable parameter type documentation, and you never miss another rename when you're refactoring, and there's no latent type mismatches. And just a little teeny preview of this. So um, the, uh, the, there's a piece of Python that glues I2B to an R, and it kind of handles some web stuff, right? And so here's your typical piece of Python that handles some web stuff. This is using the traditional WSGI, and everybody knows the types of the ENV and start response parameters, right? So if you're a good boy, you write them down anyway. Um, you say that the environment is a dictionary, the HTTP request headers maybe, and you, the re return type is a sequence of, of strings. So all we need to do to use this tool is to write down the types in a slightly more formal way, use Scala syntax, it turns out, uh, and then you run the, the, the Pi to Scala tool, and then you run the results through the Scala compiler, and it actually tells you if you've got any type errors or, or, or typos and stuff. So that was kind of a fun thing. And it, it pretty much just uses the existing conventions. It's not too far, so you can still run the, the results through Sphinx and you get nice looking documentation. All right, so we would like, to, on behalf of our uh, teams back home, uh, uh, we'd like to thank them and especially the nurses and physicians who are really doing the hard work. And even more especially the patients who, is, who are what we're ultimately doing this all for. <laughs> All right, we've got just a couple minutes for some questions. Thank you. In the back. Oh. Uh oh. No mind. I'll ask a question. Oh. Okay. Um, you mentioned something very interesting in the beginning. Data changes uh, constantly. So two questions about this. A, how, do you, how much your data changes? Because you said your predictions should be approximately the same according to the changes of data. So how much are they the same? Are they the same every month, every year? This is the first question. Second question is, what are you going to do for the future? Because there will be streams of data coming from all sorts of other devices that you don't see now. So are you planning for that? On the first question, how much do things change? Um, uh, there's, boy, that's a, 
So the hospital is rolling out the electronic medical record system. So some, some of the clinics are using it and some of them are not. They're using it for some things and not for others. Um, anyway, so there's operational things like that. Just the data, you know, we get a few more patients. That we go from 1.1 million to 1.1 million to 1.2 million. The labs grows from so many to so many. Um, uh, we, one of the, the QA checks we do is to make sure it's more every month. So usually, sometimes like our, uh, our um, ethnicity information went down one month and we had to go talk to the hospital people, what's going on? They were representing the data differently. So, you know, you can imagine the problems there. Uh, do, we, do we have a limit for growth? The growth is maybe limited by hardware or something, I don't know. Uh, but that's, we're not really close to the limits there. Uh, as, as to the future, we've got that development process. Th we've incorporated new things every month for 35 months. It's, that's kind of our process and our plan. That's as far as we can see forward. Uh, so I have a question. Uh, so it's really interesting watching the Python, watching Python and his tools progress through different communities. Sort of started with, I don't know what, it went to scientific computing, we've seen it in finance, we've seen it in ads, we've seen it in data processing. Uh, and now it's sort of landing in medical informatics. Uh, can you guys talk a little bit about the community uh, is, there, is there a community in, in Python, in medical informatics? Is that growing? Are there tools? As sort of pioneers, what do you find in that space? There is, I'm pretty sure, so I don't, there's, there's biomedical informatics where they talk us about pulse and diagnosis and all that kind of stuff. And then there's bioinformatics that talks about A's and G's and T's and C's and, and that kind of stuff. Protein and the bioinformatics code. community is big on, there's py, Python stuff all over the place there. But Bio, go ahead. We're, we're, we're sort of, we're certainly trying to 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 build a um, medical informatics uh, community around Python, and and th there's it's it's in some ways there's there's a bit of a culture gap uh, between the sort of the uh, um, very um, uptight kind of very very formal and 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 you know um, attitude of of, um, of 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 the medical establishment and sort of the the um, the hacker uh, ethic of of the um, of of the uh, you know of of the of, of, of many of the Python developers. Yeah, but I'm a longtime web guy, so every time I put two brain cells together, it's on the web. And then I, I ran into somebody at a conference that was working in the bio, the life sciences, and he was like, "You showed somebody before it was published," you know. <laughs> so, yeah, very different approaches. Maybe um, one more quick question. Yeah, quick question. So of, of your system today, like what is one of the things you would most like to improve about it? Like what do you think the, the weakest or most annoying spot is? <laughs> um, full disclosure, I'm not entirely sure about paver, frankly. Uh, um, we've sort of abstracted the use of paver more and more out. The guy who developed paver, I think, is sort of uh, end of life it and, and moved on to something else. And I wonder about... Um, uh, that approach. And what I'm trying to do, while I still remember what it's like to not know any of this stuff and look and have this sinking feeling in my stomach when I see that dependency graph, is to document as many of the questions I had that got answered for the next developer. Because that's, and in general, I think that's a heuristic you should do. When you're learning something for the first time, remember what it is you didn't know, because that's what the next people are also going to be stumped by. And you have this unique superpower as a noob, if you're a noob at something, and everyone's a noob at something, um, to, to, to write useful documentation yeah. that people who know too much about it are no longer capable of writing. That's a great point, the, uh, the expertise of the novice. <laughs> okay, let's, uh, let's give them a round of applause. Thank right. you. Thanks, everybody. Uh, and in a few minutes, we'll have Wes McKinney up. All right, thank you.